Okay, I, I think the first had to do with the vulnerability of Nigeria to oil, and, and it, is, it is a big problem, and, I, and, I've, been, and I've, I've said this all the time. Um, oil accounts for 13% of our GDP, but it's 80% of government revenue, directly or indirectly more than that, uh, because you know, when, you, when you look at what's called um, non-oil revenue in the Federation, it tends to be largely driven by customs duties, and our imports increase when oil price goes up. So even the non-oil revenue is highly correlated to oil revenue. If oil prices go down, and not, just, not only do we lose petroleum profits taxes and royalties, we also lose customs duties because we can import less. Um, so for 13% of GDP, it plays a disproportionate role, um, certainly in the fiscal space. Um, it's, uh, I mean, when oil price went up to 147 um, dollars a barrel, we built up reserves of 62 billion. When it crashed to under 40 dollars a barrel, reserves crashed to under 30 billion. We lost 30 billion dollars in reserves in two years. The exchange rate lost about 25, 30 um, percent. The government deficit, um, uh, government come from a surplus to a huge deficit. And a lot of the fiscal challenges we have remain because of the huge dependence on oil. So um, one of the reasons we've got to have structural reforms, apart from having inclusive growth, is to also diversify the revenue base of the government. Now just think of it, 42% of our GDP is agriculture. How much tax do you get from poor peasant farmers? Nothing. So government doesn't earn anything from 42% of GDP. And the only way you can tax farming is to invest in infrastructure, invest in extension services, ex invest in productivity. Cereal in Nigeria production today is 1.8 metric tons per hectare. In Southern Africa and East Africa, it's six metric tons. In Southeast Asia, it's eight metric tons. In China, okay, they've got varieties of rice that give 14 metric tons per hectare and we are on 1.8. Now that just tells you by how much you can increase productivity by simply providing the right seeds, the right training, the right irrigation so it is not rain fed and access to markets. And then begin to tax that business and diversify the, gov the revenue base of the government. If it's 13% of GDP, you should get to a point where it doesn't contribute more than 15 to 20% of government revenues. But you can't do that until you open up those areas. We don't have um, corporate taxes, apart from the large multinational corporations, most of the SMEs are not profitable. Um, if you want to set up a tax, if you go as a youth, <laughs> and, 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 uh, if you want to set up a, a small textiles firm today, you've got to think not just of where you're going to get the cotton and the equipment for converting cotton into lint and, and lint into, into, into textiles and fabric, you have to be your own power plant. You've got to think of your generator. I've got to think of a backup generator. You've got to think of diesel. You may have to think of security. So you have to be your own power plant. You have to be your own security company. You, maybe you have to build the road you know, out of your factory. No, seriously. So um, you can't find a banker because the bank is not financing a textiles company. It's financing a power plant, it's financing a security company, a transportation company, and a textiles company and it expects to be repaid from the cash flows from textiles business. The model simply doesn't work. And this is what the Chinese did. They simply spent a lot of money building first class infrastructure, using Chinese owned banks to lend money. Sometimes some of that money was basically bad loans. The Chinese government would issue a 10, 15 year bond, clean up the banks, recapitalize them, build the infrastructure, and then let private entrepreneurs build the factory. So you, you're not thinking of electricity, you're not thinking of roads, you're not thinking of, of, of security. You want to go, you're doing textiles, or you're doing computer uh, programming, or you're doing um, um, leather products. That is what you're there for. You're not there to provide yourself with electricity and security and market access. And this is, I think, what we need to keep telling government, with, for, for those of us in and those of you outside, just create the enabling environment for the private sector to go in and, and produce. And that's the only way you can have growth. But, but you're right on that. Original integration. Um, 
I, I'm a strong advocate of regional <coughs> integration. I think, uh, I, I, but you know, when uh, politicians talk about integration, they also they talk about other things. They talk about a common currency. Um, and a central bank governor, I'm not sure it's exactly music to my ears. You know, I, 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 we've seen the euro, and uh, I think we're still in a hurry to get into the afro. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and, and you know, when, 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 I came, when I became governor of Central Bank and this whole thing started about the West African common currency and African common currency, and I said, okay, well, let's go back to the theory. What does economics tell you? You, you, you have a common currency to reduce transaction costs, okay? Now, what transaction costs are you reducing if only 10% of trade in Africa is with African countries? So you want me to give up my independence as central bank for trade that is less than 10%? I mean, for Nigeria, all our oil exports, practically everything goes outside Africa. When Europe went into the euro, 65% of Europe, European trade was intra-European. You can see the sense of a common currency. Okay, so we haven't gone through that step of having trade integration. We haven't gone through the stage of having mobility of citizens, as mentioned by the gentleman from Malawi, okay? We haven't gone through the step of movement of goods and services. I mean, people ask me, if I close my eyes and if I had a dream of Africa, what, what do I see? And I say, you know, I see an Africa where you build gas pipelines from the Niger Delta across the whole of West Africa, from Algeria across the whole of North Africa, from Mozambique, Angola, South Africa to South and East Africa to complement the hydro plants being built by Ethiopia on the Nile and what we're building on Kainji. So that when you look at Africa and take satellite pictures of the world, you no longer just see this black continent. It's also as light as, as everybody else. And electricity alone in Africa opens up opportunities for tremendous growth. Then you link up with rail lines. Why is it easier for me to go to Lagos? I can, I can just drive to the airport without a ticket in Lagos, and I know I can get a plane to anywhere in Europe. I can go, I can take Air France, I can take KLM, I can take BA, I can take Virgin, I can take ARIC, everybody. Now, if I try to go, I remember the first time I went to Malawi, you know, um, we had to charter a jet because by the time I looked at the countries I had to go through, I'd have had a three-day trip, you know? Um, and this was a time, I think, when they had problems with the British before the... Uh, I, but now I think that the president is dead. They will, um, but, but, you know, it's, it's important to say, before you talk about integration, how do we build infrastructure? How do you build compared? Why is it cheaper to import goods 3,000 miles from China to Lagos than to take those goods from Johannesburg. Why can't I get on a train in Yaoundé and go to Cape Town? Why? You know? I, on Friday, um, from Paris, we went on the train to Bruges, came to Brussels, went back to Paris. And, you know, why can't you do that in Africa? Now, when you get to that, and you actually begin to have movement of people and goods. And for us in Nigeria, forget, forget the wider region. This is a market of 167 million people. Okay, it's a market for Europeans, it's a market for the Chinese, it can be a market for African goods. So the thinking I think we've got to look at is, how do you make Africa a market for goods produced um, in Africa? Um, on the third question on, so, on how we can get the common people to understand this is the problem, part of the problem is how do you get the politicians to stop using religion and ethnicity in politics? Because that shapes the mindset, that shapes public discourse. If you have an election, and again, Nigeria is a good example, and you were there. We had a presidential election. What was the big issue about the presidential election? It was, should the president come from the north or from the south? That was the big issue. Is that not true? That was the big issue of debate. Should we zone the presidency? Should it come from the north or the south? It wasn't about who's going to deliver power. What is your position on education? What is your view of the economy? What is your foreign policy? 
I mean, the kind of things that people are talking about when you look at Sarkozy and Holland or when you look at Cameron, you know, you, you look at Nigerian political debates, it's, 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 it is our turn. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's, uh, so, so now, if that is what is happening at the level of contestation for political office, that is what defines people. And once you define an election in terms of whether the president is from the north or the south, Whoever wins, a part of the country feels it has lost. Nobody ever feels that they've won, and that is what we've got to get away from. Um, and that's what you and I have to do. It's not about government, it's about us Nigerians saying these are the issues we want to see um, discussed and put them on the table. Um, the, on, on this whole issue of finance, and I think they're, they're all related, let me just say that finance only works in the context of a right economic policy. Right now, I mean, if you take Nigeria, I don't think we have any issues on the monetary side. And I think with Ngozi in finance, the fiscal issues are coming under control. But we can provide stability. Monetary policy and fiscal policy can provide stability. You want growth, you've got to have the structural reforms. You've got to change agriculture from primary production to high value added. You've got to move from exporting crude oil to exporting refined petroleum products and building a petrochemicals industry. You've got to stop exporting cassava to exporting ethanol and starch, you know, and so on you've got to stop exporting your cotton and start producing textiles locally, um, and so on. So those are the, the key issues. Um, links up to AMPDC. For the questions from outside, you win. Um, as a very loyal public servant, I endorse it 100%. Um, I, I believe in it, but I have made my point. Um, governments are not there to say they are creating jobs. Governments are there to create an economy that grows and when that economy grows, the economy itself provides the jobs. Um, so if you want to create a job, you've got to say, what are you doing to unlock the structural problems uh, that get in the way of jobs? And these are the hard infrastructure, like power and roads and security, also the soft in infrastructure, like the right skills that will turn human beings into an economic force, um, in in into labor. Um, on transparency in the banking industry, um, over the last two and a half years, I'm sure you know, we have worked on cleaning up the banking system, and, and that is um, out there. Uh, we have um, introduced IFRS. Uh, we've just set up in the central bank um, a consumer complaints department, please, if you have any issues. We have a whole department now that deals with customer complaints um, and, 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 and consumer education. Uh, we're dealing with infringements. Uh, we're the only country in the world after the crisis that is locking up bank CEOs and recovering money from them that was taken. Um, we just had um, an IMF stress test and report um, on the banking industry that gave us a clean bill of health. Um, so, but transparency, risk management, governance are never a destination. They're a process. Uh, it, they, they are ongoing. We continue to improve. Uh, we're very far ahead of where we were two years ago, but we still have a long way to go. Thanks. We have just enough time to take some questions from this side of the house. Yeah. Please, can you make it quick? No. <laughs> the second one, you mentioned your EDC um, and how you set up centers and how it actually changed the whole process. But um, is the central bank um, thinking about or supporting some of these universities? You mentioned the universities we have in Nigeria and how we have so much going into them, but not little coming out. Um, is the central bank thinking of supporting some of these universities, funding some of the programs, and even sponsoring Nigerians to get to school? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you there. Yeah. You've got people up there, I think. Yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know.
Thank you very much. The last question from up there. Yeah. Supporting the government. Please, we don't have much time. Can you go straight to the question? Okay, thank you very much. The last say goes to the people on the internet. <laughs> right, thanks. Um, now, on, on Akin Bala, I think, I think it's important to know that there are a number of cases. Okay, we had um, federal high court um, cases on him, um, or the court threw out, and we've appealed. We, we think there was no basis for throwing out those cases. Um, we do have state um, high court cases, which are criminal, because there are certain crimes that are charged under the state high court. And if you're charging someone with criminal theft, it's um, state high court. Now, those cases are ongoing. So it's important to know that um, um, he's not free yet. And um, the appeal um, is that we, we, we have no doubt that we, we're not on a witch hunting exercise and that anybody that we are prosecuting, we've got hard evidence. Okay, uh, we've already jailed one CEO. I can guarantee you there are two bank CEOs that will go to jail. There's, there's simply, the, the evidence is just too hard, okay, for, for it. Um, Oh, for it. And, 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 and you know, the, the whole thing is not again about Akimbola or anybody. It's about saying as a country there are lines that cannot be crossed. And it's about saying to the bankers that if 90% of the capital you trade with is money from depositors and creditors given to you on trust, then you have to behave responsibly. It's one thing to make mistakes. It's one thing to take bad decisions. It's another thing to set up SPVs, lend money to yourself, and take that money out to buy property abroad. That's theft. It's not risk management. And we've got to say, you cannot steal depositors' money. Okay, and the reason the country has continued the way it's gone, and I've said this on this fuel subsidy thing, for example, if you actually have a probe, and if you actually establish that people pretended to bring in petroleum products that they did not bring in, it's not enough to ask them to pay back the money. They should go to jail. Because you can't tell your children that it is fine to steal money so long as you pay it back. You can't. You've got to put people in jail. Okay, in fact, I would rather have someone locked up than pay money and walk away. It's fine to, to lock him up and let, and, and let the money go. So these are issues that, um, uh, that are ongoing. On the universities, um, the central bank has built centers of excellence in three universities. We're building in three more. And these centers of excellence are designed not just to build structures, but we have an MOU with these institutions with a budget that's supposed to uh, have professorial chairs, pro, um, basically um, equip a library, and train postgraduate students for the financial services industry. We've built these centers, um, I think we've completed in Suka, Ibadan, and um, ABU. Uh, we're also doing JOS, um, Kano, and Port Harcourt. So we are working uh, with the university, which leads me up to the last question. Um, the central bank has not taken over the role of government. The central bank in a developing economy cannot be an inflation targeter. I've always told people, if you want me to think like Ben Bananke 
or Mervyn King, make me governor of the Bank of England. Um, I'm governor of the central bank in a developing economy. And I cannot run away from issues of agriculture. I can't run away from education. I can't run away from power. I can't run away from infrastructure. Okay, now the level of engagement depends on the structures that we have, and nature abhors, abhors a vacuum. Some of the policies that are being implemented today by the Minister of Agriculture, in fact, all of them, and my colleagues are here, we spent one year with the Minister of Agriculture when he was Vice President of the um, um, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. We commissioned him, we paid the Monitor Group and McKinsey to do a comprehensive research on Nigerian agricultural value chains and come up with the right policies. So the minister is implementing a blueprint that was produced by the Central Bank of Nigeria. It's not my job to produce a blueprint for agriculture, but I'm happy that the Central Bank has done this. The power interventions that we did, for which we were criticized two years ago, have added 500 megawatts of electricity to Nigeria. So even this 5,000 we're talking about, 10% of that came from loans directly given by banks drawing on the facility the Central Bank gave. And we can tell you the exact power plants and the number of jobs created. So, yes, um, is it development? Yes. Um, should I apologize for the central bank being in development? No. I've told the IMF, I've told the World Bank, Nigeria is a developing economy. By definition, the central bank of Nigeria is a development central bank. Okay? So we'll complement government, we'll not take over. And we, we do hope that the government will work so well that I can have the peace of other central bank governors where I do nothing but every two months come and meet and, and then announce the interest rates and then go back to sleep for another two months, you know? <laughs> That's what I would love to do. I don't want to be having problems with the National Assembly, problems with this person, attacked in, by the press for getting out of my scope. I don't want to do that. I want to be an inflation targeting central bank, but I can't afford to be sitting there um, uh, where, where I sit. Um, Boko Haram, um, I, may I say that I'm an ordinary governor of the central bank. I'm not the president, I'm not the minister of defense or NSA. The only thing I can do is in the performance of my duty as a monetary authority and financial regulator, and the performance of my duty as an economic advisor to the government and as a Nigerian, make those contributions to policy that will make sure that we adopt, the, we create the right environment that changes these youth, okay, from being militants to being productive members of society and giving them a future. That's, uh, that's what I have been doing, that's what I will continue doing, but it's something that all of us in Africa need to do, call on our governments to build an economy that is growing, but an economy that while growing brings more and more people who are in the bottom of the pyramid um, up uh, to a level where, they are, um, where allevi we alleviate uh, poverty. So, um, uh, thank you very much. Can you talk on the new way? <laughs> yes. um, there's a question on the UN program, uh, which is a government sponsored program for uh, entrepreneurship for young people in Nigeria. Okay, I mean, the, uh, basically, UN is about um, dedicating a fund that has arranged competition uh, for young people who come up with ideas and um, then they're given capital with which to, I think we've already uh, identified some winners. Um, the Minister of Finance was given a report two weeks ago about some of the feedback they got from the youth who were extremely excited because for the first time they went through a competitive process and they didn't have to know anybody to get capital. Um, this is a laudable initiative, but I think my position is very clear that you can create through you win a few thousand jobs, okay? you'd create many more jobs if you fix power. You'd create many more jobs if you address the security situation. You'd create many more jobs if you do irrigation in agriculture. So um, again, this is part of the job creation and um, incentive programs that are a drip, um, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, okay, a drop in the ocean. The real big challenge before us is to address these structural reforms and make sure we move them. And, and we could, if we made progress between 2003 and now, we would have made much more progress. Uh, I think we've, um, we've delayed. It's time to continue with those programs and we don't have uh, much time. You win cannot take the place of building um, the economy and addressing these um, structural issues, but it's a good thing. And um, 
I'm sure the finance minister will be in a much better position to give details of um, how far they've gone. Thanks.